Hello, my dear friends. How are you? I'm Ari Therger, and today I'm here to speak about the god Odin and this deity's association with the wild hunt. Let's get straight to it. There are two things we must take into consideration. Folk beliefs and the dead. To begin with, the idea of the wild hunt and its association with the Germanic god Odin is a fusion of several conceptions. The conception of the wild hunt is mostly found within post-Christian late folklore. Just because a pagan god is in it doesn't mean that in its entirety the wild hunt is a pagan conception. We are talking about folklore, which is a body of knowledge that is never static and it grows and expands through time, through cultural influences as well as religious syncretism and the blending of several belief systems. The wild hunt is a conception which, in my opinion, we could say it is the product of the cognitive understanding of the landscape. That is, the observation of the environment in which people inhabit and the conceptions that create a body of knowledge to better understand the standing point of the human being within the space it lives and experiences things, how and why the landscape behaves in the way it does and how it affects the human being. The cognitive understanding of the landscape contributes to a better understanding of the mythological arrangement about the involved environment and, consequently, of the imaginary of uh, Germanic and Old Norse beliefs, belief systems uh, in the case we are dealing with here today, of course. We are in the presence of a um, conception that is capable of immersing the audience into the very environment, being in contact with what can be seen and known and experienced in the natural landscape, and at the same time also helping to understand the belief systems through these associations. We are talking about the changing of natural cycles, as the wild hunt is mostly associated with Yuletide, the end of the year and the turn of the cycle, but also in association with the dead. To be more precise, associated with the fear of the returning dead. And to be even more specific and precise, it is the fear of the return of the harmful dead. As was previously spoken on the video concerning the celebration of Alpha plot, uh, which I'll leave a link down below in the description for you to see. Don't worry. Well, in the celebration of Alpha blot, a sacrifice to the elves, we understand that we are in the presence of a celebration towards the beneficial dead, the beneficial ancestors, which even after death and with the proper propitiations and respecting social taboos, the beneficial ancestors can still help the living in their yearly behaviors towards survival. But not all the dead are beneficial. Not all ancestors are good, useful, valuable, and even worthy to be honored and remembered. I've also spoken about this before, concerning the ancestors in animism, uh, another video that goes to the description of, of this video right here. Well, <laughs> the point is, not every person in life was good and death doesn't necessarily change them. There was the fear of the returning dead, the ones that in life were so evil and cruel that in death they could return and still torment people. Some people cause deep traumas and folklore in great part is constructed as a means of survival through oral tradition to help to remember traumatic moments and how to avoid past misfortune. And as I was saying, some people have or leave deep traumas in communities and upon death they are not worthy to be honored or remembered, even if they are ancestors. Honoring such ancestors would be a mistake, as the rites within ancestors worship are meant to call upon the ancestors for their beneficial wisdom. Calling upon harmful ancestors, however, is to keep their presence within the community, and that is seen as calling upon 
misfortune and bad luck. The dead that are not worthy to be remembered and the ones people fear the most because they may return and cause harm, obviously. The wild hunt presents this fear, this trauma, the return of the harmful dead. Now, the act of naming things is a cognitive process that helps human beings to build and understand the world around them and the role of life and death and how it influences the course of events and the changing of the cycles. There is a relationship with the process of attributing meaning to landscapes and the phenomenon that happens in them that has real influence upon human communities of the living, which in turn contributes to the knowledge on uh, cognitive landscapes with details of space and time that are either understood as beneficial or less good or even dangerous. That is, naming something builds an understanding of that thing and from the moment there is an, an association between idea and space and time, generations of human beings understand what these spaces, ideas and times mean and what they can bring to human society. So spaces and moments in time are either avoided or used depending on their names and the information those names highlight. Name giving to spaces and yearly moments and cycles not only is a way of experiencing the world around us, but also a way of survival. The wild hunt, this name giving to a period of time, is to remember a, per a, a perilous time, a dangerous time for human communities of the living. And every element in it is to enhance fear to create avoidance in order to survive. This is one of the reasons why Odin was retained in this type of traumatic folklore. To recall the once pagan god of the dead, of death, and which, through the Christian religious perception, had become an entity of evil. So we are talking about parts of mythological narratives that are retained in folklore in order to augment the fear of past traumas merged with the particular change of weather during winter added to the fear of the dead as forces, energy, spirits and entities that reside in the world. But not just the fear of any dead, but the harmful dead, the ones that are the opposite of the beneficial ancestors that are usually called upon during harvest celebrations. The harmful ancestors bring about destruction and death, which is perceived during winter, when all vegetation dies out and withers. Winter is not a time of fertility and it is not a time for things to grow and thrive for the benefit of the human community of the living. Winter is a time of survival. A cultural construction of conceptions embedded in the cognitive landscape, picking up elements lived and experienced in the world and conceptualizing the sacred and the religious for a better immersion with life and understanding it. So let us delve into this subject. Perhaps one of the subjects we ought to briefly mention here, and of course maybe a subject for another time, is the corporeal existence of the dead. It has been mostly thanks to cinematography and attempts in adapting old lore to the new visual art of cinema that the ghosts of the dead have become somewhat these translucent shades with the former appearance of a once living human person. Ethereal beings that rarely have a more physical presence and consequences on human lives. However, looking at several belief systems all over the world, mythological accounts, folklore and stories of the dead, even up to the late Middle Ages and into the modern period, every time we are dealing with the fear of the dead, we understand they are much more than just ghosts, but rather they have a corporeal existence, a significant physical presence within human lives. They are what we call, call revenants, 
the dead that return from their burials, in physical form, their own bodies possessing traces of their own consciousness. They return with purpose, and that is often looking for vengeance, or simply because they were evil in life, and as such, beyond death, they come again to continue to torment the living, the collective trauma, right? As we are talking about uh, Germanic belief systems, actually the greatest body of lore concerning this is actually found in Icelandic sagas and folklore. To be more precise, the fear of the Draugr, the walking dead that inhabits its burial place, and from time to time may return and cause harm because it has a corporeal existence, a physical existence. It is the manifestation of the awakened consciousness in its former body. As such, it has the power to physically hurt the living. The Icelandic Draugr is certainly the survival of other such beings found in earlier belief systems all over. While in pre-Christian Scandinavia we see a greater focus on the beneficial ancestors and rites performed at their burial mounds, we progressively see in later Icelandic sagas a more concrete fear of the harmful dead that do not stay dead and come to torment the living. This doesn't mean that in pagan times people did not fear the dead. They did. It just means that with the progressive change of religious mentality and celebrations and rituals and the right way to propitiate the dead were put aside and forgotten. As such, there was no longer the knowledge on how to properly appease the dead and make sure they stay in their burials. This also contributed to the fear of the dead returning, particularly the ones that either caused trauma or their untimely, unexpected or abnormal deaths forced them to return to and prey on the living. The rituals are forgotten, but not the trauma. And the trauma of death is retained in folk beliefs, giving us a body of knowledge that reflects upon this trauma and ways to avoid it. The wild hunt comes as this precisely, a time to be avoided by the living because death and the return of the harmful dead happens at specific moments and people avoid such times lest they are taken by the dead. The conception of the wild hunt probably in part already existed in pre-Christian times as an idea to reinforce the feeling that at particular harsh and cruel moments of the year one should avoid exposure in the world to avoid untimely death. And this was picked up again by clerics with great success uh, because to the idea of the fear of the returning dead was added that sinners, criminals, unbaptized children, people who had died without the sacraments or who died unrepented would all find their place in this infernal cavalcade led by a one-eyed giant who was often black. Through Christianity, other types of dead people were added to the procession of harmful dead. And these were the socially religious members of society that had somehow failed within the religious moral. In other words, people who went to hell could return in this procession led by a one-eyed entity. The tormented dead, some of whom find their way in this procession across the sky as punishment and they can equally take with them people under the same circumstances, that is, sinners. The one-eyed giant here reports to Odin, which in several other folkloric versions of a conception of the wild hunt are more concrete in relation to the presence of Odin, uh, returning, retaining in folklore uh, an unholy event that could only be led by none other than the ancient god of death and the dead. Such a name remembered precisely due to the great importance and spread of the cult of Odin in the north. Odin, since the migration period in Scandinavia, progressively became one of the most important deities of the Scandinavian Iron Age, finding its way into the Icelandic medieval literary sources later on, 
becoming the king and father of the gods. When something is highly important in a society, there are more chances that it stays within the collective memory. And even though rituals and belief systems may be forgotten, many names are not due to the action of name giving to create association and a better understanding of the landscape in which humans experience life. The wild hunt retained the darkest and more fearful aspects of this deity. But we shall get to it. Odin is, without a doubt, a very interesting person, of which I have talked about here several times. Many names, many appearances. Most of the time, up to no good, and quite often surrounded by death and the dead. I won't repeat myself when it comes to the evolution on the religious perception of Odin through the ages. I've done that in several other videos. From the Germanic god of war and death, to the Scandinavian god of poetry, magic and battle fury and death again, to the Icelandic chieftain and father of the gods and death once more. The most acceptable interpretation of the Germanic name Woten is this very general idea of the god who brings ecstasy, the mental excitement, fury, intoxication, even possession. Similar is the meaning of the Old Norse adjective author from which Othin, the later form of the name in Scandinavia, derived from, meaning raging, intoxicated fury, often poetically used for inspiration. The connection of the god of death with inspiration and possession seems indeed to be quite the old conception for this deity, even before the introduction of the cult of this deity in Scandinavia during the migration period. Overall, Odin is the god of poetry, magic, and the dead. In Scandinavia, the cult of Odin gained tremendous proportions among the elite by the end of the Iron Age. What is interesting to notice is that place names called after this deity are scattered and rare. Even though having become quite the important god among the elites, and many of the place names after this god show us important places of his worship. But the name was rare throughout the landscape, mostly because, well, uh, fertility deities were much more venerated among the great majority of the population. But also, and probably, rare place names after Odin due to the fear of the name of this deity, which, after all, is the dreadful deity of death. The majority of place names after this deity are found in Sweden, 49 place names derived from Odin, which isn't surprising given the amount of death-related ceremonies, processions and rites during the Iron Age and the famous human sacrifices at Old Uppsala. Death surrounds this deity and it is perfectly understandable the fear of this god by the great majority of the population that focused much more on fertility deities. The great importance and fame of this god was mostly among the elite, the aristocracy, and not among the common folk. So it is understandable why, in the collective mentality of the people, this deity continued to evoke fear and a sense of dread, and not surprisingly retained in traditional folk magic as a powerful demonic entity from whom great harmful magic can be achieved. This may give us a reason why Odin became associated with the wild hunt in post-Christian later folk beliefs, recalling the fear of this deity of death now becoming the demonic leader of this, uh, on, this on his great horse, of this terrifying spectral procession of lost souls riding through the air. <laughs> and, not surprising again, in much later folklore, Odin, as the dreadful leader of the Wild Hunt, became the Christian devil in this same procession of souls who have failed the Christian faith. So, it is perfectly understandable, once again, <laughs> why Odin was remembered in this way in the memory of the people, reminding us of the terror his name must have once inspired. 
not just the terror of death, but the human sacrifices as well, and the dreadful, terrifying god of the warlords. In fact, it should be noted that it is curious that during the Viking Age, we progressively see poetry changing the perception people had of this deity still in heathen times. Some poems start to accuse Odin of treachery and faithlessness, which shows a reaction against the cult of Odin himself. Still, the seemingly shamanic attributes of Odin and uh, as a god of death and quite often being able to cross worlds and delve deep into the realms of the dead is an earlier conception which has been somewhat retained in memory, blending with the fear of the return of the vengeful and the harmful dead coming into the world again, led by the very deity that walks among the dead. Trauma is one of the most important factors as the roots of folk beliefs and at the core of the construction of many folk beliefs. The cult of Odin was traumatic. The very sources that speak of the ecstatic trance and altered states of consciousness involving this deity are quite brutal and gruesome. Provoked death, self-inflicted injuries and near-death experiences, the trauma of war, untimely death, death in strange circumstances, religious human sacrifices, battle frenzy, poetic madness, many myths where Odin is responsible for the death of others, including the innocent, the bad luck of all of those who follow Odin, and being the god who takes to Valhall, the dead, from the battlefield. Collective trauma deeply ingrained in folk memory. Throughout the Germanic regions, uh, there are several names that denote the common concept of the wild hunt as a ghostly ride across the storms and the skies during the 12 nights of Yuletide. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce each of the terms as they are in different languages and every time I speak a different language I have to switch to the personality I have created for each so I'm trying to avoid having a stroke. Anyway, it is curious to see the, this conception widespread across the Germanic regions, which indeed makes us think of a common past, at least in the cognitive perception of the landscape, as well as a main theme shared by several populations. However, I think some scholars skipped the folklore classes. Even though there's a common Germanic theme of a spectral cavalcade in the Germanic regions. It is not a concept exclusively of these cultural backgrounds. The theme is quite widespread all over Europe. If we look into Western Iberian Peninsula, we will find the same theme with different names. A ghostly procession of spirits and the souls of the dead. Looking into other European mythologies and folklore, we may not find a specific name for this ghostly cavalcade of the dead, but we do find specific deities at the head of an army of dead ancestral beings. Several deities, m most of which goddesses actually, whose role is to accompany departed souls, goddesses of ghosts and nightmares, and as psychopomps of the dead. The very theme of the witch ride and witches going into the Sabbath follows the same theme. We also find this in several legends and uh, of, of ghostly horsemen in the midwinter sky uh, in Celtic mythology. Some of these traditions continued on even into the 19th century. We are talking about a widespread theme of supernatural entities who act as psychopomps and either take the dead, accompany the dead, or some bring death. In the case of, uh, of the Germanic regions, this theme will be connected to Odin as the obvious choice for an entity of death and of the dead. The wild hunt is a conception that takes several centuries to develop into what we know today from folklore. It is the merging of several themes, conceptions, rites of passage, mythological scenes, traumas, fears, harvest festivities and religious developments towards the 
cognitive landscape and regional social identities. The wild hunt is a reflection of several centuries, if not indeed thousands of years, of several cultural syncretisms, which in the Germanic regions will be linked to Odin. Just the same way similar themes will be linked to other entities related to death in other regions and other cultures. However, it is important to state that before the Christian theme of lost souls uh, of sinners being the dead who ride with Odin during this event, there's probably an early understanding of warrior bands following Odin on a spectral cavalcade. Not just the theme of Valhalla as the afterlife place for the glorious dead who have died in the battlefield, but also a connection to the warriors of aristocracy whose religious focus on the cult of Odin led them to spend the afterlife with this deity in Valhalla, returning to torment people during winter. War, carnage, battle, traumatic themes that evoke death and the infertility of the soils. War, which brings untimely death, the death of innocence, the death of young ones, the abandonment of home, family and fields. War, in many ways, resembles winter time. The god of the dead warriors comes in winter to spread death. War isn't made during winter, but the same sentiments, the same trauma, is reflected upon the land during winter time, the cognitive landscape. As I've said previously, Odin being the god of ecstasy and ultra states of consciousness, often associated with warriors or warrior bands within the cult of Odin, is a significant factor, making Odin the prominent figure who leads the dead warriors across the sky. The harmful dead, the cruel dead, the violent dead, coming again to cause destruction and a rupture in people's lives. The theme of warrior bands in the Odinic cult ecstasy was still quite the strong conception in the 11th century Scandinavia and remained as such in Nordic literature. Just to be certain I have made myself clear and the message passed on, the wild hunt isn't entirely a post-Christian conception, but instead a product of folklore which merges several ideas, factors and notions throughout the ages, culminating on this great scene of a spectral cavalcade led by a one-eyed demonic being. The wild hunt tales themselves, the folkloric content are of medieval and later dates already into the modern period, and are linked to the role played by the god Odin in folklore long after the period of active belief in the old gods. However, as said before, folklore isn't built in a day. Folklore transmits several ideas from several periods of human history and the conceptions blend pretty well. Important elements of the wild hunt indeed report back to heathen times and other pagan perceptions. Some important elements of these medieval and modern tales of the wild hunt can be traced back to a more general belief in the Viking Age, in which several types of supernatural beings would ride to torment people, either single riders or in groups, and whose appearance was often associated with a premonition of doom, a dire warning, or a sign of great change and death about to take place. This is the type of trauma and fear that lies in the core of the later tales that would become the wild hunt, recalling supernatural beings of the pagan past that would come to torment people. I've spoken here about the warrior bands, most likely a reference to the Berserkir, which in post-Christian Nordic medieval literature not only are figures related to the pagan past and coming to torment people, kidnapping and killing people, but also the connection to the pagan cult of Odin remains. But there are other supernatural beings we should indeed briefly make reference to. The Valkyriur. Valkyries, Valkyriur, are supernatural beings directly connected with the gods, and with Odin in particular, acting as choosers of the slain and bringing the valiant dead to Valhalla. So we have the presence of these 
symbology of beings connected to Odin and taking the dead. Supernatural entities related to death and fate. Valkyries have been quite romanticized in postmodern periods, giving them this very gentle and caring touch, taking away the dead to their final resting places. However, Old Norse sources, in their great majority, in reference to Valkyries, of course, portray quite the gruesome supernatural entities performing battle magic and weaving the fate of battle and those who are to die through the entrails and mutilated body parts of the dead. Not all sources refer to the Valkyries like this, but a great body of knowledge specifically portrays them as beings of destruction. Just as Odin, Valkyries are also connected to magic, but specifically battle magic. Valkyrjur are related to the world of war and the magic performances aimed at that. Valkyries are one of the most well-known aspects of Norse religion and have captured the popular imagination. It's not the post-industrial romantic representations of the Valkyries that were retained in early folklore, but rather this portrayal of supernatural beings associated with Odin that come to pick the corpses on the battlefield. The earlier version of the Valkyrjur give us an understanding of supernatural beings whose main function seems to have been to select which warriors would die in battle and to bring them accordingly to Odin. So this idea is retained and reflected upon the later tales of the Wild Hunt as a cavalcade led by the God of the Dead and not only accompanied by the dead themselves, but by a troop of supernatural beings that come to torment people and pick the dead or bring death and take people away. They kidnap those fated to die. So this element of the pagan past is also retained in the folklore concerning the Wild Hunt, the later conceptions of a great quantity of spirits who ride the storms of midwinter sky during the nights of Yule, terrorizing the population and sometimes carrying people away. So, watch the skies, be wary. If it is not in your latest plans to meet death and be carried away, see that you spend more time at home during midwinter nights. We will be watching you. My dear friends, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, Dag Forita. Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Until we meet again, my dear friends.